Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Building a Startup Nation a webinar series where we feature universities as well as startups and map out you know, how they came to be and their stories as entrepreneurs and startups. So today is April 6th and we are, uh, this is the second of a series and we're featuring George Washington University and their startup successes. And this afternoon, we are featuring three of their, uh, three of their most prominent startups and there's the stories behind, um, behind their success and how George Washington University um, supported them. Uh, you know, in their development. So before we begin, I just have a couple of reminders uh, to everyone uh, joining the call uh, today. So the slides presented in this webinar uh, will be available as well as the recording will be available um, in 24 hours after the webinar concludes. But if anyone has questions about you know about the webinar or about any of the presenters today please send us an email at support at nset2.org we will open the webinar this afternoon to questions from the audience so please you know write them down and we will have a chat box open to you so just type in your questions in the chat box of your go to webinar control panel and we will handle the questions after all the presenters have gone through uh, their slides. Uh, one of the things that we need to point out is we'll try to get as to as many questions as we can and hopefully you know your question gets in the queue. But before we we, we go forward to introducing who's presenting this afternoon, um, just a quick you know a quick intro on building a startup nation. So this is a webinar series where we generally talk about startups, universities, and how they connect to each other and how they support each other, basically to create new jobs and to, you know, keep the United States on top of the national innovation, um, national innovation initiatives of, you know, globally. So this, this series features the different stories of different startups. So if you have a startup or if you're working for a university and you'd like to be part uh, of this webinar series, just send us an email and we'd be happy to get in touch with you to see how we could help you out and broadcast your message. Also, Building a Startup Nation is also part of a bigger program, an experiential learning program to provide university and college students the opportunities to work um, in the innovation community. So we connect them up not only to engage with Congress, but also with startups, entrepreneurs, as well as different investors around the country. So uh, this series is actually being put together by our um, by the NSET2 uh, student fellows so you'll hear a little bit more about that later today. So today's presenters, without further ado, so we have four presenters this afternoon. So one of them is Dr. Steve Kubison. He's the Managing Director of the George Washington Technology Commercialization Office. And we are featuring three of his startups this afternoon. So one of them is Jim, Jim Cantrell. He's the founder and CEO of Vector Space Systems. He's, uh, he's actually going to tell you a very interesting story today, as well as Tisha Jepson, co-founder and CEO of True Bearing Diagnostics, and Ben Holmes, CEO, CEO of Nanocon. And I'd like to point out that Ben was actually selected as one of the best university startups of 2016 in our last demo day. So it'd be good to hear an update from him um, as well. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn it over now to Steve to start us off. So Steve, are you ready? Yes. All right, here you go. Okay. So can you see my slides? Yes, they are up. Okay. All right. So uh, again, I'm Steve Kibison. Uh, so for those of you who may not know what technology commercialization offices do in universities, we're basically a bridging function between the university and companies and startups. The, the cultures of a university and a company are quite different, and so it's a multi-faceted process to move these inventions out of the university into commercial development in companies. We have a small office at GW. We have four people, and we augment that staff with uh, approximately four interns that help us with the uh, diligence as well as some of the marketing of our technologies. And the interns are a key part of our operation. They find it extremely valuable to be exposed to real business deals 
and we actually try to help them find positions after they, they graduate, and we do that through our connections. So the university culture is really unique. This is a, uh, some work that was done by a Russian psychologist years ago, 50 plus years ago. And it talks about where you, you know, what are the conditions where you can get inspiration. You have to have a balance between knowledge and complexity. Uh, if you have too much knowledge and not enough complexity, you get bored. If you have too much complexity and too little knowledge, you get frustrated. But in that middle zone, that 45 degree line, you you get an inspiration zone. And one of the key things is it can't really, you know, inventions can't be set on a stopwatch or, or, or programmed out. So you need to have some flexibility there. And that's what a university is really good at, letting that... Uh, uh, free flow of information. But when you're moving into a company, you need to be more disciplined. So that's why we need to connect to the outside world. The technology, uh, this shows the technology value curve, everything where you're starting with an idea, proof of concept in the lab. But the real key point is, and you see that inflection point on the curve, is when you've moved it on the physical science side into a prototype and on the life science side into some sort of a clinical trial. And that's where uh, startups are absolutely critical to the commercialization effort because corporations today, ever since 2008, are, are more and more risk adverse and they want to see not only technology verified, but they want to see some sort of a market validation. So this process doesn't occur that fast. It's just a chart that uh, shows timelines on how long it is before, once you commercialize before you're going to see sales, which translates into royalties back to the university. It's, it's years. And uh, so it does take a little time to incubate these things. Uh, that bridge that I showed before, it's actually a three-lane bridge. Uh, I often talk about we need to con combine technology people and funding uh, when we're forming these startups, uh, you know, moving the technology from basic research to applied research to productization and manufacturing and sales. And you have different sort of people. You move in from researchers, faculty to uh, product developers and business people. And the funding, you, know, you move out of the federal lab programs with NH and SF, NSF would typically provide into angel funding, VC funding, state funding. You know, you can't have federal funding with uh, small business innovative research type grants. Now there's a uh, sports car in the bottom there because this, this process needs to be relatively fast because all technologies have a life cycle. And so a key thing is in our office is to make sure once we have an invention, we're, we're out there marketing in it, uh, trying to identify an entrepreneur that wants to take it forward and trying to see if there's funding available. Uh, this just sort of shows a global view of the various elements. Again, it's the technology, people, and money that we need to bring to bear in uh, supporting the entrepreneurs to take the technology forward. Um, I also happen to be an angel investor, so I'm very familiar with investors look for in a startup company and the, the key one is actually the fourth one on the list management team uh, any investor will tell you that give a mediocre idea to a great management team you've got a great chance of success because they'll modify it and make it work put a great idea into a mediocre business team and you may fail because the minute they hit a road bump it, it falls apart but you also need to have a you know a proprietary technology great business um, good business plan and a growing market. Uh, this is a list of some of the startups that have come out of GW uh, in, since I came in uh, fiscal year, uh, well, 2013. And you, you can see there it's a variety of life science technologies as well as physical science technologies. The, um, I will say Voxiva just exited last week. Uh, La Jolla, uh, which is actually a, a publicly traded company now, um, just finished its phase three clinical trial with favorable results. And so that, that one looks to be a, a real uh, rocket going off for us, besides Vector Space, which is, of course, also a rocket company. Um, but it's a, we have three of our star CEOs on the line with us today, um, which uh, 
Rhea has already introduced, but th this just gives you a flavor for an uh, institution like GW. We, we actually produce probably two to three times the amount of startups than you might expect on the national average, and that's because we do put a focus on it, and we really uh, try to connect with the best entrepreneurs that can take the technologies forward. The final chart here just gives sort of a global view of universities and how they have evolved over the last centuries. You notice the timeline on the bottom goes back to 1100. You know, universities originally were developed to share knowledge. After World War II, that when you started doing research, they were tasked with developing knowledge. And really, ever since the global economic crisis of the early 2000s, more and more governments are realizing that universities can be a source of innovation. Um, it's reported that over half the drugs uh, we have came out of universities. So there's a more and more of a push into what was generally referred to as a third generation university, which is taking that knowledge that came out of the research and putting it to work to help uh, society and grow the economy. And with that, this is just my contact information and uh, happy to answer questions at the end. So Jim, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm understanding this correctly. You're at the first rocket ship launch uh, for your company and you need to evacuate soon, right? Jim, are you there? If we need to go out of order, I'm ready just in case. Yeah, go ahead, Tisha. Can everyone see my screen yet? Hold on. You're good, Tisha. Okay, great. Hi, um, my name is Tisha Jepson and I'm with True Bearing Diagnostics. We are one of the results of the tireless efforts that um, GW has been working with with us. So I'm going to go back and just talk a little bit about myself and how did we start and then I'll tell about our company. I am, oh, goodness gracious, I am currently a master's student at Johns Hopkins and I have over 15 years experience working with scientists, doctors, university technology transfer offices. The, the event, uh, this, this effort, you. Um, yes. They're ready for you on the webinar. If you can't make it, I'll do your slides. Bye. Um, so again, this is Tisha Jepson, and I am working with Tim McCaffrey's lab and am working in a collaborative effort with the St. Lawrence Institute. And essentially, the St. Lawrence Institute and the Department of Genomics with Dr. Tim McCaffrey have been working for a number of years on developing different efforts using a systems biology approach to uh, address degenerative diseases. The effort that we're currently working on is coronary artery disease. And this effort came together from both of the St. Lawrence Institute and Tim McCaffrey's labs. Uh, we are able to do what we've been doing as a result of working together with the university and taking the technology that I'll describe in just a little bit further through the efforts of GW's Technology Commercialization Office. Steve, Dr. Steve Kubison and Brian Koblitz uh, have been spearheading their efforts, our efforts to transition. We have built upon the experiences that I have had with the St. Lawrence Institute and other organizations and are working tightly with the um, GW Technology Commercialization Office. They've been offering us support with IP development, with our patents, patents and licensing. They've also assisted with putting us through lean startup training through the i -Corps program and given us access to additional capital to, in addition to that which we already had, just bolstering our efforts to make sure that we can transition from the lab into a marketed 
entity, an organization that is commercially focused. It's been amazing to ha see that transition and to have the resources and startups. I recommend that anybody at the university that is interested in starting a new company or transitioning what their data and research has into something that would be marketable to go to the Office of Research, I'm sorry, of Technology Transfer Resources and to Steve Kubison and Brian Koldlitz. It's been awesome. So now to what we are here to talk about more specifically, our company. True Bearing is a unique diagnostics for personalized medicine. We run our tests as a blood test. It's an RNA-based target that we have developed utilizing the labs at GW and also genetic sequencing from another organization, the uh, SQL, an amplification-free approach that I'll describe in a little bit. We are focused at this point specifically on coronary artery disease, and we, in this year and partially into next year, we'll be completing our human trials for TrueCAD, the coronary artery, artery disease blood test. And then in 2018, we will go to market uh, in the hospitals that have participated with these trials. And then 2019 and forward, we will finalize our FDA approval, which will be in process throughout this time, and go into the preventative care market. Why are we entering this market? Why did we choose this one? Well, coronary artery disease is the largest of the healthcare diseases in terms of mortality and expense. It's responsible for 600,000 deaths a year and 500, over $500 billion a year. 50% of first heart attacks are, were never on anyone's radar and 50% of those are 25% fatal. So, uh, I'm sorry, 50% of those are fatal. So, um, not 25%, sorry. Um, in terms of artery disease and testing, there are about $17 billion a year spent on testing, stress tests, angiograms, caths, all of these tests are important, but many of them are not necessary. Many of the ones that are performed are not necessary. Our blood test will enable people to make the decision more accurately as to whether they need those expensive tests before the tests are undertaken and thereby saving billions of dollars. The reason that one of the potential hurdles into this and, and to change the way that we approach medicine preventatively as opposed to aggressively with expensive tests will be facilitated through a change in regulations. Medicare and other government regulators starting in 2019 will be actually de-incentivizing the more expensive tests and encouraging the more preventative approach for medicine moving forward. So that's a pretty exciting step and will enable us to facilitate our approach with coronary artery disease. Our approach is one in which we will be um, initially addressing people who are presenting with chest pain and they will, instead of having their family history taken and their lifestyle taken, that will happen, but additional to that, there will be a blood test. And this will reduce by 40% and possibly up to 70% on certain of the tests, the numbers of invasive testing. Nuclear stress test, for example, is very uh, aggressive in the amount of radiation that one is exposed to. So one wants to only take those tests when necessary. And additionally, coronary angiograms are aggressive and can be potentially dangerous as well. So having a blood test to determine when those are necessary is really important. One of the ways that we were able to address our approach is through RNA. RNA is very important in the sense that it is changeable throughout one's life. DNA is the same, and that's a wonderful picture of what a person's transcript looks like. But in order to understand the small changes and to see the arrival of small of diseases, one has to see the tiniest changes, the 1.3 to 1.5 fold changes in the RNA, and thereby detect those diseases. And the way we were able to achieve that is through an amplification-free approach. So we've been able to detect small changes in the, in the RNA and thereby um, address and detect and answer potentially the uh, question of coronary artery disease. Our accuracy rate, if one were to look at what's currently available, the clinical model, family history and lifestyle, one is able to see the rock. If you look on the left, the ROC curve is 0.636. 
And if you look at the rock area on the, um, uh, to the right, oh, goodness gracious, to the right, you see a rock area of 0.873. If you add to that, and that's our, with our targets, the RNA targets, if you add to that just one factor, the age factor, it brings that rock curve to 0.917. This is essentially the gold standard level of blood testing and allows our test to be able to make clinical, make medical decisions for patients moving forward. We are initially going to be working with hospitals and with cardiologists and providing the TrueCAD blood test for hearts, heart attack symptoms, in addition to helping people who are diabetics or who have a family history. That will be our first entry to market in 2018. Then we will move once we have FDA approval in 2019 into the preventative care market. And finally, we'll move into the therapeutic care market, um, which will mean that we can track the progress of therapies and potentially change course as opposed to waiting until the next event, um, change course midstream. Our, our way of entering into the business will be that we will be creating partnerships with hospitals and conducting trials and then transitioning from those collaborative efforts into a business model wherein we will sell the tests um, to those hospitals and those will be paid for by the payers within the hospital systems. Once those key opinion leaders have been selling, have been working with the test after having worked, studied this test, we will then transition to the preventative care market and finalize with our FDA approval and the transition to the preventative care market using those key opinion leaders that were partnering with us on the original test. 2016, we achieved our provisional patent and licensing was completed. 2017, we are uh, performing our clinical validation testing and raising capital. And 2018, we will go to market within those collaborative hospitals that were participating with us on the clinical trial and will continue to raise capital. Then in 2019, we will have our FDA approval for TrueCAD and enter the preventative market. In 2020 and beyond, we will um, perform our exit strategy with an IPO and roll out additional diagnostics. Our tree management team is composed of myself with um, actually 15 years of experience with startup companies starting and including the St. Lauren Institute and SQL with Tim McCaffrey, our director of genomic medicine at GW and co-founder, and he is our chief scientific officer, and Ian Toma, a US Fulbright scholar and scientist in our laboratories. Thank you so much for your time. Again, my name is Tisha Jepson, and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Wow, that's amazing, Tisha. Um, thank you. Ben, before we send the slides over to you, I'm just gonna double check and see if Jim got back on the call. He did. Oh, okay. Oh, he did. Jim, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead when you're ready. Hopefully this will last. I, uh, <laughs> I have to apologize for noise and communications challenges. I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, the Mojave Desert right now. We're getting uh, about 20 minutes away from our first launch, so I'm going to have to talk and run. Uh, we're loading oxygen right now, so uh, it's been uh, one of those mornings. So let me uh, give you a little bit about uh, Vector. So um, I'm Jim Cantrell. I'm the CEO, one of the co-founders of Vector. And uh, what we are is a space access company. And our, our basic uh, business approach is to lower the barriers to getting both the, the satellites and later the ideas into space. And as we've seen over the last uh, 30 to 40 years, commercial space has grown dramatically. And what we're seeing today it's something akin to what happened in the computer industry 20 years ago where the PC came on the scene and literally exploded in giving access to the average person to a pretty sophisticated IT machinery. We can see what's what's come from that. So my my connection to uh, GWU is through Steve Cubison personally. He and I were uh, both in Utah back in uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, and about that time, uh, a guy named Elon Musk called me out of the blue 
and uh, we, uh, we he wanted to uh, buy some Russian rockets to fly some experiments to Mars to show that humanity could become a multi-planetary species. So I became later no better known as the guy who, who introduced him to the Russians, and and when they wouldn't sell the rocket, we decided to build a rocket itself, and that became SpaceX, which a lot of people know about. So uh, I was one of the early founders of that, and uh, left after a while. And uh, what you see here with Vector is um, the original guys that were on the founding team of SpaceX came together about a year ago, and uh, we bought up a company that. Uh, uh, one of the original SpaceX guys had started 15 years ago developing a much smaller rocket than what Elon had in mind. So what we have here is uh, uh, that rocket, and we're about to launch our first one today. So our overall vision is to take um, space access from what it is today, which is very hardware-centric, costs hundreds of millions of dollars and takes years to get in place, something tomorrow that's software centric and and this is important because if you look at the innovation in today's culture it's around youth and it's around software and that's where the innovation is so what we're looking to do is eventually create a constellation of satellites uh, with our own launch vehicles to launch them that will allow individuals to program satellites much like you program apps on a cell phone so that that smartphone you're holding in your hand uh, we're basically uh, trying to put that in space and uh, create a worldwide network that can be used in that sense. So it's a big vision. The market's huge. It's, you know, right now it's approaching a trillion dollars, the uh, space industry. And uh, the, the software-centric satellites uh, really tap into the, the service side of that industry, which is almost uh, $400 billion today. So mentioned earlier the microsatellites are in the new PC and you can see here the launch mass of satellites as it's evolved over the last uh, 30 years and um, what, what you're starting to see is smaller satellites proliferating that are you know two three ten twenty pounds and over time those will become more and more capable owing really a lot to cell phone technology microelectronics and micro mechanical systems and what we're finding today is the, uh, the 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 large satellites that go to geostationary orbit, where you get direct TV and things like that, are giving way to much smaller, much less expensive satellites launched uh, closer to the, the surface of the Earth, where there's more space and um, where they can uh, actually operate more energy efficiently. So we think that is the new PC. So the first part of our business plan is to develop uh, launch vehicles, and you can see we've got two of them. We're developing They're basically the same vehicle. One's a little bit larger than the other. And the reason we have two different ones is to address sort of the market uncertainty in terms of the size range that the, the market's going to need. So we have an agile manufacturing approach that uses common parts, so the engines are all the same. But basically, the Vector R is what we're launching today, and it's a very small rocket that puts about 150 pounds into orbit, uh, which will take you know a, a pretty good-sized satellite the size of, say, a HP laser jet printer could be an imaging satellite, could be a radar satellite, or a lot of these smaller CubeSats that are about the size of a loaf of bread. So there's a huge market for this. There's over a thousand of these satellites waiting to be launched. The satellites already been built. They can't get there on these big launch vehicles for a lot of different reasons. So we have a ready-made market waiting for us with this, and we think this uh, this this ability to launch 100 a year is uh, going to fundamentally change the way people think about space access. And getting their satellites in place. So our, our first flights are in 2017. You can see here on the left, um, this is a vehicle we took to uh, Cape Canaveral a few weeks ago and they erected it. Our, our launch uh, approach is very simple. We just need a concrete pad. In the case of the Mojave Desert here, we're actually on a on a, uh, a launch range, but we don't have any concrete pad below it. So what we have standing out here next to me is uh, is something that looks like um, uh, a launch vehicle that's ready to launch, uh, but on dirt. So we uh, licensed the electric uh, third stage technology from GWU, and we're using that uh, on our third stage of the rocket to do something that nobody else has done, which is provide a highly efficient electric propulsion uh, that GWU developed to take these satellites even higher uh, without having to have a much bigger rocket. So this allows us for a million and a half dollar rocket to do the job of a ten million dollar rocket, so it's a it's a it's a high leverage point technology. 
So in terms of where we're at, we've sold 108 launches so far to commercial clients. We've got a, a almost $4 million in R&D contract to help develop this rocket from the federal government. And we have a bridge round open until about the 17th of April. We're working a uh, Series A financing right now. We hope to close that second quarter this year. And our first full-scale flight is today. And I just got a note that I've got to get out of here. So uh, I'm going to uh, just get to the last uh, contact page here and apologize for uh, missing any questions. But Steve can probably answer a lot because he's, he's very familiar. Uh, sorry about the timing, Jim, but thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today. I know you have to go. Yep, yeah, thanks. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Ben, uh, whenever you're ready, we'll send over the slides. Okay, great. All right, everybody, you can see me all right? Yes. All right, great. Okay, so uh, my name is Ben Holmes, and I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of NanoCon. Uh, we're a company that's working on 3D printing and novel material-based approaches to orthopedic repair. And our first pr product that we're commercializing is a implantable medical device for cartilage repair in the knee. So to kind of share our vision a little bit and, and talk you know, about what that means, uh, you know, currently in the field of orthopedics, if you have extensive joint damage, uh, you know, there's a there's a very good treatment out there, and that's a a metallic total joint replacement, uh, and they they work pretty well and have good clinical outcomes. Except that uh, because of the life the lifespan of of these metallic implants, um, they are only put in people that are 55 and older. So if you are a young and active patient who um, has you know a sports related injury or is in the the first stages of osteoarthritis. Um, they're much more limited and less effective options. Um, so what, what we really want to do here is uh, using 3D printing and a novel material, which I'll talk about in detail later, uh, we want to offer an implantable device for repairing cartilage damage in the knee that has a greatly accelerated recovery time of you know, no more than six months, um, can be very, very cost effective due to the fact that it's uh, you know, both both made from a relatively low cost material uh, compared to some of these other treatments, uh, and then also uh, through the use of 3D printing, uh, these implants can be made in a much more sort of you know on demand, uh, patient specific way, which uh, you know greatly increases uh, the margins uh, both for payers and hospitals, and just in general because it's a uh, easily manufactured uh, material, we can provide. A device that is, uh, you know, much easier to manufacture, sterilize, and implement for hospitals. So our initial market that we're looking at in in knee repair is around two billion, um, and then we also see an opportunity once once we're able to penetrate that market and demonstrate uh, demonstrate efficacy and obviously get FDA approval. Then we there's also a lot of opportunity to use this technology in other complementary uh, joints such as uh, you know repairing uh, the joint in your jaw, uh, doing shoulder and hip, uh, and perhaps even spine. And, and we've estimated that just going into two additional markets, we'd be able to add another five to six billion dollars in value. Um, now, I do also want to talk about uh, our our strategy that uh, we would like to go to market first, actually in uh, the equine veterinary market. So using our device uh, to repair cartilage damage in the knees of sport and race horses. Um, and we want to do that for, for several re reasons, uh, again, that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, mostly having to do with uh, the, the time it would take to get to market and then, and then an ability to really demonstrate the efficacy of, of the device and getting real time on the product. So the technology itself is an implantable patch that's really designed to uh, you know, fill fill missing areas of cartilage uh, on the surface of the knee. Um, so we have both a novel 3D printed design as well as a new material, which has cartilage-like properties, both um, biophysiologically and then also mechanically. So it allows us to create an implant that is able to structurally replace the cartilage as soon as it's implanted, um, but also encourages the, the rapid fusion to bone as well as the ingrowth of new cartilage in and around and over top of, of this microstructure. So what we're able to do is, is have an implant which provides a much more stable 
uh, mechanically stable as well as biologically stable uh, repair of, of the injury. And we've also done quite a bit of work already uh, to, to validate this technology. Uh, we've done extensive uh, testing in, in the lab in a petri dish type setting and shown that uh, this does indeed grow bone really, really well. Um, it develops uh, this, this calcium ion coating, which is, is really important for the uh, acceptance and integration of uh, a, a um, orthopedic implant. And then also we've, we've shown that that bone uh, vascularizes, so, which is also important. So you actually have the, the creation of, of new healthy bone. And then also in, a, uh, in an animal study at Children's National Medical Center, we were able to show that the implant also causes the, the generation of, of new cartilage. And those are those, those pink images that you're seeing on the bottom there. That's a histological stain of, of our implant compared to some controls. And we showed that you know, we get fusion of the, of the bone as well as the creation of, of new cartilage uh, into and over the top of the implant, uh, you know, effectively resurfacing the, the damaged area. So the company right right now is still very small. It's just my myself and my co-founder, uh, but we do have a great team of uh, people advising us. We have research partners that are from you know uh, 3D printing, uh, the tissue engineering and biomaterials field, um, orthopedics. Uh, we also have several several um, surgeons on our advisory board, um, as well as getting continued support from from GW and the commercialization office. And then we also now have um, partnership with people in the equine veterinary space, um, both at Virginia Tech, Colorado State, and then uh, also at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and then we also have members, advisory members with business and indirect, in, uh, industry experience. We have uh, members from past cartilage therapeutic startups that have uh, a lot of FDA as well as manufacturing experience. Uh, we have other people from medical device manufacturing, biomaterials, as well as uh, product development and marketing for orthopedic devices. So we are, uh, as I mentioned, looking at um, you know pretty high level of regulatory clearance, at least as far as a, a human device is concerned. Um, you're looking at needing to get a pre-market approval to do human testing. Uh, at this point, we need to do some additional safety uh, and toxicity results, although the fact that we put this in uh, small animals and they they lived uh, you know up to the the three month, um, experimental time point and didn't show any signs of infection or rejection, uh, you know, is, is a very good sign. So when we, do, when we are able to do these tests, we'll get positive results. Um, we also need to do an efficacy study in a, in a large animal. Typically, goats and, and sheep are um, what is, is preferred. And then um, after, after that, which would be about a year, then we'd be looking at, uh, uh, you know, two years for human testing. Now, I, I also mentioned earlier that we want to go into the equine veterinary market, uh, which could really have an impact for access to the human market um, because there's very little you have to do uh, for FDA compliance when you're trying to get a veterinary uh, product approved. So something very simple, um, uh, like a, a pilot study, you don't have to do sterilization validation, you don't need to do any, any safety study, um, and that could be you know just a several month process. Um, and then on top of that, there have, have been several high profile cartilage devices or cartilage therapeutics in the, in the past uh, decade, which had really great preclinical results in that, in that goat study or in that sheep study. And then when they went to go do uh, phase one and phase two clinical trials in, in humans, um, the results were good, mainly because the, you know, the metrics going from a more research-based experiment to going to a clinical trial are, are very different. Um, especially when you're talking about recovery time and you know return return to activity um, of the patient, and so we see an opportunity here to uh, you know start using this to treat again the the you know relatively the same size and location of injury, but in in uh, uh, these horses that are afflicted uh, with the injury of the disease, uh, and being able to really de-risk the technology in a very very substantial way, and then also generating revenue while we're doing that. So this is our, our current go-to-market strategy, you know, based upon that idea. Uh, right now, we're sort of in between um, uh, that second blue box and that third blue box, where we've been able to raise some initial money to do um, uh, prototyping and some, some study. And you saw those animal results. And then now we're trying to really uh, uh, get, you know, around half a million dollars, uh, substantial seed money, so that we can, you know, really produce a functional prototype and then um, 
uh, do a clinical trial with our equine partners and, and push this thing out to the market. Uh, and then beyond that, um, you know, we'd be looking at perhaps a, a $2 million raise to, uh, you know, get through initial compliance that we need for the PMA and then start the, the clinical trial for phase one. Um, and then beyond that, uh, completing a phase two potentially with uh, a partnering um, medical device company, um, either through some kind of a licensing deal or, or um, you know, if it's the right partner, um, like uh, Johnson Johnson or Medtronic actually getting uh, funding from their venture arm. But I do want to also stress that, um, you know, the opportunity in the equine space is very big. It's, it's a, a 200 to 300 million dollar uh, target market. And so if we're, if we're able to get early acceptance in that, in that market, then we see an opportunity to perhaps bootstrap uh, that initial development and, and maybe even the phase one or maybe even the phase two clinical trials uh, with revenue that we've generated from the equine product. So like I said, right now, uh, immediately we're looking for around half a million dollars to finish doing a proof of concept, either in a horse or in a large animal. Uh, and actually, we have been getting some really, really good positive feedback on an SBIR phase one that we submitted back in December. And it's looking like there's a very high probability that that project is going to get funded. So if that happens, that's great. And we've you know, mostly hit that target. Um, and then in, in a year's time, we will be looking for, uh, you know, an equity raise of about one and a half to two million. So we can, um, you know, really, really uh, do a high impact clinical study in horses and then get this product uh, on the market for the equine veterinary space in 2018. So before I finish up, I also want to talk about, um, you know, my experience uh, with, with NanoCon and launching NanoCon as it relates to, to working with GW. Um, you know, when I, um, kind of, kind of started going down this path. I was a, a, you know, just a young PhD student. I had no experience in entrepreneurship or, or in business or in tech transfer. And, uh, you know, working with Steve and other people from the uh, TCO um, really was an essential uh, opportunity to learn from me. And I, you know, I really feel like I owe a lot of my, uh, my success and NanoCon's success, uh, you know to those relationships. So like I said, they, they provided a lot of initial mentorship um, and continue to provide mentorship to this day. Also, um, you know, very, very essential was, uh, you know, help with the IP initially when I was still a student. And then also when I was ready to start the company, helping to lay the, the foundation for a, a licensing option, um, which puts the company in a, a much better position to, to transition into, uh, you know, private equity funding and, and actual marketing um, and then also there are always ongoing op uh, opportunities to network uh, you know I've I've um, had a lot of a lot of meetings that have been facilitated uh, by the office with potential mentors people from industry experienced high val uh, value individuals and then also investors who down the road and when the time is right might be interested in, in putting in some substantial money to, to scale up and go to market um, and then I also want to mention that uh, the TCO office was also very instrumental in encouraging me and, and helping me to, to get into the i program and, and get involved in the i program. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's an NSF-funded entrepreneurial training program that's designed to help you, uh, you know, actually conduct market research around some technology you want to commercialize and really lay a very solid uh, bedrock uh, to make the decision to launch a, a company or launch a commercial venture if you want to. And so I, I you know, likely would have never heard, heard about the i program or even had the, uh, you know, the initial skills um, to be accepted in that program and to be successful in that program if it weren't for the commercialization office. So anyway, again, my name is Ben Holmes and I'm the CEO of NanoCon and thank you very much everyone for your time. Ben, NanoCon is absolutely amazing. Thank you for sharing your research and time with us today. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, it's time to move on to the questions portion of the webinar. Uh, the first question I'll direct to you, Tisha. Uh, how did you get connected to the George Washington technology in, involved with True Bearing Diagnostics? Hi. Um, well, it's kind of an interesting question. A friend of mine who had moved away from science but had originally published in Cell Magazine on the, on the topic of interferon actually was talking to me about wanting to change careers and go back into science. And I encouraged him really strongly. And I said, if you come to Washington DC, I'll help you set up the lab to do it. Cause I think you should make the world a better place, uh, make your impact on the area of science, which is the thing you love. 
So we agreed that he would come back to GW and he started a lab and I helped him start it. We, we sort of did it as a team effort. And through that evolution, what, what ended up happening was the outgrowth of the St. Lawrence Institute, which became a group of people, scientists and researchers around the world who were brought together to study from a systems biology perspective, degenerative diseases, and that sprang out of that GW effort. And in addition to that, Tim McCaffrey, Dr. Tim McCaffrey, the head of genomics at GW, be joined the group and began researching with us and our present effort on coronary artery disease evolved. We also have been researching topics like Alzheimer's, appendicitis, infection, all of these things. And the St. Lawrence Institute enabled us to take a look at what was the most important thing or topic in terms of its state of, of process and progress. And once the coronary artery disease got to a certain level, we decided, okay, let's take it to the, to the next step and transition to market and go to, you know, through the cl clinical trials, go through the FDA approval process, do all of that. And that's when the people like Steve Kubison, Brian Koblitz stepped in and really helped to ramp us up because even though we have a huge support network outside of the university, and even though we, you know, we're looking, you know, we have um, advisors with FDA approval, we have other scientists working with us on various levels, both with the sequencing and with the research. It's also really fantastic to have that support within the university setting from which the original research sprang. And so through the technology transfer office of GW, we've been able to expand on that process. So it started with a, just a conversation between two friends and both of us went actually ended up going back to school and he got his PhD. I went for my second master's and now we're going to market. So, and we're collaborating with the likes of Tim McCaffrey and Steve Kubison and Brian Koblitz, who's helping us usher through uh, the next stage of healthcare for coronary artery disease, which is gonna be a game changer for healthcare. It was pretty exciting. Yeah, that's that's an amazingly inspiring uh, story. Thank you for sharing, Tisha. Um, ben, would you mind sharing the story behind how you became connected to the technology for Nanocon? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, Nanocon really began, um, you know, about about four years ago uh, when my co-founder and I were PhD students together in the tissue engineering lab at at George Washington. And we were both sort of working in the biomaterial, nanomaterial, stem cell development area. And then we all also both kind of transitioned at the same time into, into studying 3D printing based technologies for orthopedics. Um, and we both were working a lot in both, you know, bone and cartilage and sort of doing complementary projects, but not, not really working on a focused piece of technology together. And so, um, you know, very early on, so, you know, only several years into our, our programs, we both participated in the local i uh, cohort that's run out of GW. Um, and in the process of going through that, we both decided that, you know, we really wanted to, you know, develop a, a piece of technology that was as, as mature as possible, uh, that we could really start a company around when we both were done with our, our studies. And so, uh, you know, we kind of started making our work more collaborative and then, uh, you know, we're able to, you know, find both both um, a, a base for the technology itself in 3D printing and using this novel material, and then also in uh, its application in repairing, uh, you know, these critical sized cartilage uh, injuries and cartilage damage in, in younger patients. Um, and then when I when I graduated from from my PhD program, uh, you know, the technology was substantial enough. We had a pretty decent understanding of the market, and then we also had uh, you know solid IP uh, that we could start the company around, and so I think a week after I, I graduated officially, uh, went out and and we filed the paperwork and, and started the company, um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And and you know all of those all of those things, you know, both going through I Corps, um, you know, getting the IP really finalized, um, and and yeah, just in general getting 
you know, the benefit of, of the experience and the network of, of Steve and other people in the office, you know, all helped make that possible. Thanks, Ben. I think it's, I think for a lot of listeners, it may come as a surprise to know uh, that there are so many resources and opportunities available to students who pursue research through higher education. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve, if, if you want to jump in on that question before we move on, I, I recall you mentioning in a previous conversation someone otherwise known as the Renaissance Man at GW. Uh, would you mind sharing that story? Steve, are you there? Okay. I guess he won't be sharing that story, but it's an incredible guy. Uh, anyways, we'll move on. Oh, I, uh, I guess I'm unmuted now. Oh, okay, great. Hello? Yeah, we can okay. hear you. So, okay, so the, uh, the, this Renaissance man, which is the term that I, I use for one of our professors, and it's, it's, it's really the highest compliment I can give someone, is Dr. Michael Kadar, who's actually in our mechanical and aerospace engineering department. He's a physicist. And uh, he's the one that developed the technology, this plasma thruster or electric third stage, as Jim referred to it, that's used in the vector space technology. But he's also took that technology and uh, worked with some collaborators initially at uh, Johns Hopkins and found out that the uh, that platform technology of a plasma could be used to preferentially kill cancer cells and leave healthy cells alone. And, and we've licensed that out to another company that's commercializing it. They're currently going through the FDA procedure. It has been used, uh, FDA allowed compassionate use for a uh, patient with uh, very severe pancreatic cancer and uh, it was successful and he continues to live. And then the third area where that same platform technology was used by Dr. Kadar is to generate graphene, which is a highly conductive, is used for conductive applications as well as reinforcement and composites. So it it's a case where you have a faculty member that's very inquisitive and collaborative and works outside of his, uh, forgive the pun, you know, normal space to uh, take his technology into multiple areas. So I think it's a, it's a great story. Um, in terms of how a technology can really have pretty major impact in the world. Yeah, that's that's remarkable. I, it's it seems like George Washington is really uh, attracting a lot of amazing talent. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, so thanks to everyone who tuned in uh, and all of our remarkable speakers for sharing their time with us today. If any of you uh, listening in are in or around the DC area on April 20th, you're more than welcome to come support the NSET2 fellows at the Congressional Visitor Center as we present our findings to Congress from the national survey efforts uh, that we're working on as well as our webinar takeaways. Uh, we will also be streaming the coverage live and we'll send that info in an email next week along with our survey, so please stay tuned. And if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to fill out the survey, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, if you would like to take a part in this movement, please sign up at nset2.org slash internship. Uh, and if you would like to take the survey right away, right away uh, feel free to copy down the link on the screen. Tisha, Ben, Steve, uh, thank you for your time. Jim's already left, but thank you as well. Uh, it's been great hearing about some of the remarkable research coming out of universities, especially George Washington. Uh, to the listeners, we look forward to some of you tuning in on April 20th uh, and hopefully filling out the survey. So don't, uh, don't forget to check your emails. Till then, uh, goodbye and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.